First is to tell us a bit about your new work on Rise of the Robots. And also, do you view this as a description of what's happening already or a prediction for the future? And second, tell us how to fix graduate education in economics. Uh, the floor is yours. Good. We'll also learn something about your priorities. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, robots. It may be the same answer for very, both, no, right? Very, <laughs> very, very, very quick. Yeah, robots could teach our classes, too. <laughs> uh, very quick on, on robots. Fascinating. I'm a, you know, I'm a technophile and a techno-believer. Uh, and I do believe that we are in a very rapid ascent of uh, information technology. And I believe that it is displacing lots of jobs and that it is one of the reasons for the low wages, the, the stagnation of real earnings in the economy because the path of manufacturing employment, which we talked about, has uh, shrunk considerably, chronically. More will come. It will also in uh, it will also spread through the service economy as well. Uh, you don't need baristas in Starbucks. We will walk in soon to a Starbucks and our iris will be scanned. Uh, and uh, your default mode of a mocha latte vente um, will come out automatically of a machine and you'll take it out the other uh, Door and they'll there will predict which days you're going to come, even, right? Pardon me? They'll predict which days you're going to come. Yeah, they'll have time. a very good idea. They'll welcome you by name, of course, as you arrive, but we were expecting you 10 minutes late. Is everything okay, Mr. Sachs? <laughs> uh, and uh, because uh, Google will know where you are any moment anyway. Um, so that's coming, and it will transform fundamentally the labor market. Now, the interesting conceptual question is, uh, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Now, as economists, we should say instinctively, it's a great thing. Are you kidding? We can have the robots do all the work for us. And I believe that's what we've hoped for ever since leaving Eden, you know, when we were condemned to work uh, in the fields 10,000 years ago in the Neolithic Revolution. We've been trying to escape heavy labor. Um, and if the robots will do it, fantastic. But there is this actually deep conceptual question, which is, what is it? There is something right, actually, theoretically, about the argument that the demand for labor falls, the wages decline, and that can actually lead to a downward spiral in our economies. And so I have a, another, I have a paper from last year with uh, Larry Kotlikoff showing how that works. I have another paper coming out in a couple of weeks that I really like, uh, showing uh, in an overlapping generations context how you can get weird outcomes. But what's always true is that with enough government intervention, redistribution of various kinds from old to young, for example, from capital owners to uh, labor owners, of course you can make everybody better off because of pure technological change by definition, if properly mm -hmm. uh, handled, can make everybody better off. So this question of how we're going to handle this transition is a really interesting one. I believe it's happening. I believe it's a fascinating subject for analysis and research. And I believe it's not been studied in very much depth yet. And that leads me to the second question. Okay. Because uh, it is a good segue. What do we learn in economics? And I believe not the right things. Uh, and I'll take just this question. In my view, whether it's the geography questions or the manufacturing question that you asked about or the robotics or whatever it is, what's fascinating for us in our real lives and in our societal choices is the change that we're constantly living in during this past 230 years since Watt gave us the steam engine. And we've been in 230 years of relentless change. Technological change, structural change, societal change, cultural change. And yet our economics models are basically static meant to be timeless, and 
if we really want to understand the world, we need to go deep into understanding what Baxter is doing, or how Watson, or Baxter the robot, or Watson, or what really is changing but technologically. Concretely, now, at the graduate economics, level, what would you do with them? Yeah, so <laughs> economics, we, we <laughs> avoid that, I think, conceptually, because if you study anything too specific, it's out of date in 10 years. So we study general principles. Yep. I think that's epistemologically the weakness of our field. Because we want to be the four underlying natural forces of the social universe rather than studying specifics. So more like the anthropologists. No, more like the biologists. So if Watt and uh, Watson and Crick had uh, written their 1953 paper saying, assume n base pairs. And they can, uh, they can match uh, by n times n minus 1 over 2 combinations. It wouldn't be a very good model of DNA. But they actually said there are four base pairs, and there are two natural matchings, and it happens to be a double helix. And we're going to study the detail out of that for the next 40 years. Yeah, it's arbitrary, you know. There could be other DNA. But we're going to study this one. Now, economists don't do that because we have a harder job, actually, in some sense, which is that we're not studying a stable environment. We're studying a changing environment. So whatever we study in depth will be out of date. We're looking at a moving target. To compensate for that by never getting into detail has been our approach. But we're always behind the curve then. We never have good answers uh, when they're needed. And, tell us and in a that's sense. what I would like us to study. I would like economists to be working with engineers, to be working with public health, to be working with uh, medical professionals, so that we're actually working on the real systems of our time and adding our pieces to that, but understanding and studying that so that we have an answer to robotics, not a pure theoretical model, which is nice and fun, but something that can be helpful.